Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. And as we have a really short time, let's start straight with the demo. Uh, after all, developer conference was always very technical. So let's start with code and the demo. So here you can see I have some legacy application which contains MNIST data sample, which is well-known data sample of uh, handwritten digits on the images. And it's something like Hello World for machine learning or AI. And uh, what this application does, it's an uh, application written with some ugly C++ code because I'm not very good at uh, programming C++, so I will don't uh, show you even the code. It's written and also use Qt. And as a backend, it's a use uh, Postgres database. So when I start to uh, here, I have two tables. Uh, I have uh, a test table and train table. Train table I will is not used by this ap application. It's uh, I, but I will use it for demo later uh, after in the talk. And in the test database, there's currently nothing. And so it's empty, but when I start clicking here on the numbers, it will store the data into the database. So as you can see, uh, it start uh, to store uh, data. And the structure is very simple. It has some ID, the label, which is always zero because the images are not classified. And then there is a byte array, which basically contained byte uh, 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 content of the image. And basically that's all. That's my application. That's really a legacy application because I developed it some seven years ago for some other presentation and now I wanted to reuse it. And of course, now I would like to use some AI or machine learning goodness. Like, of course, I would like probably want to classify uh, what, is, uh, what number is written on the image when I click on it. But, well, how to do that? So this is actually what this talk will be about. My name is Vojta Juránek. I work at Red Hat as a developer on Project Debezium. And in this talk, I would uh, discuss exactly this problem, how to feed some data into some machine learning model. It will cover some uh, uh, model and some framework, but it's not important. The main focus of this talk is at the very beginning of the whole machine learning pipeline. I'm pretty aware that just uh, using data mo uh, model uh, some and using AI is pretty complex and machine learning pipelines can be pretty huge and complex. Uh, of course, for the demo and for this talk, I'm simplifying, but it doesn't impact what I'm saying here and uh, the uh, conclusions I will make. But to uh, get you some orientation where we stand, I will be discussing very beginning of the, this machine pipeline and basically how to feed the data in the, the machine learning pipeline. Because uh, to be honest, no matter how good your model is, every model is useful if you don't feed it with the data. So it's pretty important topic which is often forget to discuss. So basically, I have some databases. It can be legacy applications, but uh, not only legacy applications. It can be even pretty modern stack of microservices because typical microservice stack use a lot of microservice and typical microservice use its own database. It can be one da microservice use relation database, and another uh, microservice use some uh, uh, non uh, or object uh, store. Some can use some time series database and so on. And on the other hand, if you want uh, to use uh, some AI framework, it typically needs a lot of data from various sources to get some really useful predictions or information. So you need to combine it. So it's not uh, only about uh, legacy applications, which I use here as an example, but it's actually a problem uh, you need to solve in general. So you have sets of databases, and you need to push uh, now the data into some machine learning pipeline. So how would you do that? Any ideas? No? Uh, of course, the uh, first obvious answer is 
that I can modify my application. But if it's legacy application, believe me, when I modify slightly this my application as I don't do C++ programming, it was pretty hard because every dependency was obsolete. It, I wasn't able to compile it. It was and it was pretty terrible and it was really small application. So now if you have some huge applications, it can be really challenging to modify it. Same with some modern uh, microservice stack because typically you have a dozen microservices and you don't want to modify dozens of applications. So this is typically not an option. Another possible is, is to write some specified so dedicated application which will do the selects from the database. But how would you ensure that you get the latest data and don't miss any data? How you would ensure that you don't overload the database with the queries? Uh, so when you start to think about it and start to impose some uh, requests like that you won't have consistent data, you don't want to miss any data because if you do the select every five minutes, it can, for example, happen that the application stores data into database and delete it right after that. And when you do the next select, the record is already deleted. So you basically miss it. And so when you start to think about it, you find out that it can be pretty hard to do that. So basically, it's pretty hard and challenging problem. And my answer to this, how to solve it, is to use something which is called change data capture. As the name suggests, it's a process of observing some resource and for a change and extracting this change from the system and pushing it outside to outside world. So in terms of databases, you basically observe the database for a change. And if some change happens, you will extract the change and push it typically into some message broker. So basically, uh, uh, how to do that without using, for example, selects. So in the heart of most of the databases is something which is which is called write ahead log. It's some source of truth of each database where every single change is recorded. Whatever is happening there, even transactions which are not committed are recorded there. So what we can do is observe this write ahead log. And once we observe that some data was committed, so it means that they go live, we can extract this committed data, uh, create some events from the, them and send it to a message queue. So it sounds pretty cool, probably solve our issue, but probably it also sounds that it's not easy to implement, right? Because digging into different database internals can be pretty challenging. And it actually is, but fortunately, there's a project called Debezium, which does all the hard work for you. It's uh, de facto uh, industry standard for CDC. It's fully open source and it has connectors for all major relation databases as well as for several non-relational ones like Mongo or Cassandra. And we have a lot of integration with third party tools and frameworks, have very large community which really uh, uh, contributes a lot to the project and it's used a lot by a lot of companies in production. So it's also pretty well battle tested. So quickly I will give you to understand the demo later on how it works. There are two phases uh, how DBZoom works. It's a, a snapshot phase and streaming phase. This, uh, because uh, you get the changes, but what you, would you do just with plain changes? In most of the situation, you own also want the initial state of the database or the tables you are interested in. This is called snapshot of uh, the data and it basically select, uh, do the select from uh, the captured tables before it starts streaming. So you get actual data before uh, observing for a change. And then uh, we uh, do what I described before that we observe for a change and start streaming change which are happening to this original snapshot. You can uh, run the snapshot anytime you want, even during the uh, streaming, but I won't discuss uh, the details here. As you can see, typical record has uh, the state before, state after, some metadata like which transaction did the change, also what was uh, the operation and so on. 
So I hope this gives you at least some uh, very high level overview how DBZoom work. It, typic it can run a snapshot, which means basically gives you current status of the data and then can start streaming from given point any single change which is happening to the data, whatever the change it is, it can be update, insert, delete, uh, adding new uh, or changing the schema of the database and so on. More practical aspect how to deploy it. DBZoom uh, evolved as a, a source connector for Kafka and it's still a uh, main use case how our user use it in, inside a Kafka Connect as a source connector. So you basically deploy uh, the DBZoom connector into the Kafka Connect. It will connect to databases you are interested in, start to stream uh, the changes into the Kafka, and then you can read uh, the records directly from Kafka, or you can pass it to some Kafka Connect uh, sync connectors, which can uh, do other st uh, sync stuff with that, like, for example, replicating the data into another database. So it's pretty easy, for example, to replicate, for example, Oracle database to Postgres database. Or you can, for example, invalidate cache data. When uh, some uh, data is obsolete, you will invalidate this data in a cache for ups update the search index. There are really many use cases for DBZoom, especially in microservice world. There are a lot of patterns around that, but it would be a topic for another talk. Another option, if you don't want to use Kafka, is possibility to run DBZoom in a standalone process where it uh, has uh, some uh, syncs uh, and uh, can push the data directly into this endpoint. It can be, for example, HTTP endpoint, but uh, what is more typical is that you use some other messaging system like Pulsar, PubSub, or it can be, for example, Redis. And uh, if you are interested in especially DBZoom server and how, how to operate it, fortunately in about 90 minutes or two hours, there's a talk by two my colleagues, Jakub and Ondra, how to operate and run a DBZoom server on Kubernetes cluster. So if you are interested in more practical aspects, I would really recommend this presentation. And if you are not interested, I would recommend it anyway, because they promised qu some cool demo. So it should be a lot of fun. So I would really recommend this talk to attend. There is third option, uh, which I won't discuss in detail here, and it's possibility to embed the DBZoom application directly, uh, uh, or um, DBZoom library directly into your application. So you can even embed it directly into your application and don't need any other services running outside. So back to our original demo I have. So as uh, you probably expect, my answer how to connect my legacy application to some uh, machine learning framework is to use DBZoom, start to observe changes in the Postgres. So as I click on uh, in my application, it will start to insert the images into database. I will use DBZoom for capturing this data, passing it into the Kafka, and as nowadays, due to extreme Kafka popularity, every, almost everything is integrated with Kafka, I can read it directly from TensorFlow from Kafka and pass it into my Jupyter Notebook. This actually has some issues, uh, which I will describe later, but even after that, I will show you more easy way how to do that. This will be the, uh, let's say, hard way how to do that, but there is much more better and easy way how to do that. So, uh, let me now first what I need to do. So, I have here some Jupyter Notebook, which I will explain later on. But uh, before we start, I will uh, delete data I inserted s before, so I can have fresh a table. And uh, here is, w I need to start DBZoom. So basically, the only thing I need to do is just push uh, some configuration into Kafka Connect, which will start DBZoom inside Kafka Connect. The configuration itself is pretty easy. It is just contains some database uh, uh, credentials, uh, information about database. Then it. Uh, contains uh, the topic uh, or topic prefix to where I will stream the changes. Name of the table I will uh, 
try to capture, and here is a regular expression, so I will capture both of the tables I had in the database, because I need some data for training, so I will basically do the snapshot of the train table and use the, this data for training a model, and then I will use this test, the uh, MNIST test table for capturing uh, live data and predicting the results. And the rest of the configuration is some transformation which I will discuss a little bit later. So now uh, I will just uh, call this REST call to start uh, the Debezium. Here you can see it, it was started in uh, Kafka, so it looks good. It probably ran the snapshot and now I can start running my Jupyter Notebook. Here uh, I define the topics from which I want to read. I have train topic and test topic, so uh, for training I will use this train topic and as uh, here you can see I'm using TensorFlow I.O. for connecting to Kafka and it's just one line. Uh, this uh, decoding function I will explain a little bit later in just a minute because now the training will take some time so I will uh, run the training of the model and ge get back to it. I have here I have defined my model as you can see it's very trivial uh, model with just one hidden layer but for this trivial hello world example is pretty enough so now I will start training it and now it reading the data from uh, the test uh, train topic where I have about here you can see it read about uh, 60,000 images in my training table. So it the training is running and in the meantime I will go back to my presentation and say what can do go wrong. When you send data between various application typical issue which where you, which you can hit is issue with serialization that you uh, w create uh, some data in one application and the applic uh, transfer it over the wire and the other application can have issues to read it uh, this is exactly what I hit with TensorFlow I.O. That uh, it seems, uh, maybe it's just my ignorance and uh, lack of knowledge of TensorFlow I.O. But I wasn't able to make it working with any data type. Uh, as you may remember, I uh, stored into the database just uh, raw bytes. And Dibizium sent me it as a raw bytes. In Kafka I get raw bytes, but uh, TensorFlow I.O. somehow interpreted it as a string. So instead of list of arrays, of one array for each image, I get just some re re string re representation of, uh, of it, which looks like, like Java calling Java to string somewhere. So this is completely useless. So it, it seems that I'm out of luck and I can't using TensorFlow I.O. But fortunately, Maybe, as I said, it's lack of my knowledge, but I'm showing it as a nice example how to demonstrate how to solve issue which can happen to you with DBZoom. DBZoom and Kafka Connect has uh, a nice feature which is called single message transform. And it's a possibility to transform uh, the message before you send it out uh, from DBZoom or Kafka. There is a lot of existing transformations, and if you don't uh, find any, s any transformation which is useful for you, it's really easy to write uh, uh, your own transformation. And one uh, s specific thing which can be used for machine learning is that if you remember, I said that typically Debezium would stand at the very beginning of your machine learning pipeline and it gives you opportunity to adjust data or filter the data. So you can start capturing something and if you know that you will don't need some kind of data, you can with SMT really easily filter it out and it can give you huge savings because as it stands at the very beginning of the machine learning pipeline, you don't have to push it through the pi of through whole the pipeline and save bandwidth and probably CPU in other places because uh, you all get only the clean data. So what I do here, here is my custom uh, SMT because uh, uh, as I said, uh, my uh, 
I think the TensorFlow I/O can observe only strings or read only strings from Kafka. So as TensorFlow has pretty good support for CSVs, I just convert the image into the numbers, put create from each image one single CSV line and pass it as a string. So I don't, uh, you don't need to read the details here, but it can show you that uh, writing custom SMT is a matter of five lines of code or something like this. So it's pretty easy. And that's what I, why I get his decoding function here. And as you can see, it just read decode CSVs. So each, each, uh, image is decoded as one CSV line, and then I will convert it in the uh, next two lines into an uh, array of floats and pass it into the model. So training of my model has finished. Uh, so now I can start to use it. Here I have simple functions which takes uh, uh, the arrays of float do the prediction here, and here it plots uh, the image. So you can manually check with, because typically you use uh, Jupyter Notebook for developing models, so you want to check uh, directly what are the results. And I, for uh, the simplicity, I put here uh, for sanity check the manually. Uh, two images just to see if the model is trained and it seems everything is good because this is obviously three and it predict as a three and one more is there should be number eight yeah and I get uh, the eight so now I will start to reading from my uh, <coughs> test uh, topic and while when I start clicking on my application it should store data in my test table the BZM should extract it send to Kafka Kafka to TensorFlow and I should get immediate uh, results here here I will just plot first four images so let's let's and now I will click for example five nine eight seven and I will show first uh, here first four images five nine eight seven so here this one is wrongly classified but uh, as i said the main point of this presentation is not uh, developing the good model but to show you that even with jupyter notebook i'm able to get the result in the re real time when i click into the, uh, my application so here I showed you, uh, or I, I used this opportunity to show you some possible issues and how to fix it with s very simply with SMT. But as I said, there is a better way how to do that. Obviously, you don't need to use uh, Kafka I.O. or TensorFlow I.O. for ingesting the data, uh, but you can embed your standard Kafka client in your application and embed TensorFlow directly into your application. Obviously, the most easy is to use Python, but uh, using, for example, Java is uh, only a little bit more difficult, but it's doable and also very easy. So uh, typically in production, what you would do is that you use uh, some standard Kafka client and it's I didn't hit any issue never with this approach. So it probably ex I would expect that it would work very seamlessly. So now I, what I will show you uh, is uh, this uh, stack where I uh, will use very simple Python program. Uh, and it's again it's just has a few lines of code here I use uh, plot and predict I turn off the plotting because uh, it will be running in the backend so I don't need it and most of the application here is just configuring Kafka uh, consumer and producer because I will send data back to Kafka and to have some fancy output I will send it to Node.js and to some web page but of course this is again not, not the topic and uh, the only uh, part 
we, which is, it's really a matter of these few lines of code to read the data and uh, move it back. But before to I do that, I first need to delete my connector and deploy a new one, which is more simple. Uh, because now I don't need any SMTs. I will just, uh, because uh, standard Kafka clients can uh, deal with uh, byte data. So now I only use this one where I have uh, database uh, credentials, topic, uh, table, which I want to capture. And here on the last line, I'm saying that I don't want to do the snapshot because I have already some data there and I want to start from a fresh, fresh data. So uh, now you can see it's really, really easy without bothering with anything else. And so I will start my Python backend application. Oh, seems like I have already some data there. N never mind. I will start a Node.js application. And now when I go to this screen, OK, so there's also some number. When I start clicking here, I would should get the results here. Yeah, so you can see I click 7, get 7, 9, 0, oh, 5. So as I click, I'm getting immediately the results. So it's pretty easy. It was just a matter of deploying a Debezium into Kafka Connect with uh, that easy config file and implementing that few lines of code in Python, just reading from Kafka and sending it to back to the Kafka. So I guess it's, I persuade you, it's really easy and pretty tra transparent for the user. And in the remaining time, I will just quickly touch upon other parts because I showed you TensorFlow. But uh, the same you can do with basically any other machine learning framework you like. For example, we have a blog post about how to use it with Spark and Flink. Uh, with Spark, Kafka works pretty nicely with Flink as well. But in Flink, uh, DBZoom is even directly integrated into Flink. So uh, in case of Flink, you don't need Kafka at all and just use uh, s s Flink alone with and it has uh, built in support directly uh, in the DBZoom. And as for the future, what I showed you is pretty fine for small or mid-sized deployments, for, but for really ra large machine learning deployments, you would probably need some or want to use some uh, uh, more sophisticated uh, software for managing your data. And the emerging technology which uh, starts to uh, uh, address this problem is something which is called Feature Store, which does the management of your data, provides various functionality like uh, monitoring for data drift, labeling. It also can be used for easy sharing the data between the teams because when you have really large deployment, you typically share, have multiple teams in a company working with the, the data uh, and doing some models on top of that. So it uh, seems to be a good use case for a huge deployments and what one of the direction we, which we want to explore in the future is how Debezium can be integrated with these feature stores as feature stores typically have two parts offline store and online store offline store manage a huge pool of data and online store typically loads the data from offline store into online store and it's something like a cache of the data which are currently being used by the models so there are probably opportunities how we can integrate the Zoom with this online stores to update the cache or this cache data in real time. So this is one of the feature work we would probably maybe want to do in the future. So basically my answer to my original problem is how to ingest uh, the data from your existing data sources into mas machine models is to use the Zoom. I hopefully at least a little bit persuade you that it's really easy and transparent I'm not saying this is the only correct answer. There can be other situations where uh, something else would be appropriate. But at least if you are solving this issue, I think you should at least consider the DBZoom if you want to use it or not.
So that's all. Thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, if uh, it sounds at least a little bit interesting to you, I would recommend to check our web page or GitHub, try it out. And we have pretty large and vibrant community on Zulip or on the mailing list. So please reach out. Don't hesitate to ask any answer. And also, if you have any ideas uh, or what other integrations we can do uh, or how to use DBZoom in your specific use case, don't hesitate to share with us and we would like to listen it from you. So that's all and now it's time for the questions. Yeah? So, so the question is, uh, in database, I have structured data and... Uh, my result is basically uh, un still structured data, but it doesn't matter because uh, AI models can pretty well work on also with structured data. So you can, for example, this in if you really want to like in this SMT, you can put it into unstructured data. But I think you get even better result with structured data because uh, the work ability to work with unstructured data is just uh, like uh, nice to have, but. Okay, but y you you can you can of course uh, uh, somehow convert it into unstructured data. Or what you can do, you can start to uh, store unstructured data directly into the database. So it can also be possible. Any other questions? If no, thanks a lot for your attention again.